Hi, folks. My name is Jamie Kostelnik, and thank you for tuning into the USGS Landslide Hazards Seminar. This meeting is hosted by the Landslide Hazards Program and co-organized with contributions from Matt Thomas and Stephen Slaughter. For, for those of you who are new to this meeting, you have the ability to submit questions via the chat window or to use the raise your hand feature in combination with your microphone and video camera. We will wait until the end of the presentation to take questions. In the meantime, please do make your best do your best to make sure your microphone is muted when you aren't intending to speak. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Lauren Schaefer. Lauren received her MS and PhD from Michigan Technological University, where she studied volcanic line landslides. She then worked as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Canterbury, Colorado School of Mines, and the USGS Landslide Hazards Program, where she is now a permanent research civil engineer. She investigates landslide hazards using a variety of engineering geology principles and remote sensing techniques. Okay, Lauren, whenever you're ready. Thank you, thank you. And thanks for um, the opportunity to present today. Um, we're gonna do a deep dive into the Barry Arm landslide. Um, and describe what we know about it and how it moves and why, based on about three years now of high resolution grounded satellite observations. Um, we have a paper that was just accepted this week into JGR Solid Earth with the same title, um, so hopefully that will be coming out soon. And I just wanted to thank my co-authors, which are listed on the right, for their many contributions. This has been a real group effort in surveillance um, and analysis of the data between the USGS, DGGS, and AEC specifically for the research I'm going to present. Um, and uh, this work is also in memory of Ronnie Dannon. Um, so before we start, I just want to say that we're using the term paraglacial here to indicate rock slopes that are um, a part of or influenced by the transition from glacial to non-glacial conditions. And this is something that we see um, very commonly in the Prince William Sound, which is located in South Central Alaska and where we'll be concentrating today. So the, South, um, the Prince William Sound is about the size of Maryland. This landscape has around 150 glaciers that are rapidly evolving and generally receding which leaves behind these damaged and over steep and fjord walls that are turning out to be landslide prone. Um, if landslides form above the open water, their catastrophic failure can trigger tsunami with consequences for life and property um, many kilometers away from the landslide itself. And so Barry Arm is um, located here in the Prince William Sound with this yellow star and these other orange stars indicate um, cities that are located around the Prince William Sound. These are two photos um, looking up and down Valley um, at Berry Arm to give you a sense of place. So on the left, um, the Berry Arm landslide is outlined in white and on the right, um, it's outlined in black. Um, and so this gives you an idea of a sense of steepness of um, this landslide and also the fact that it's sitting above, partially above the Berry Arm Fjord waters and also partially above the Berry Glacier. Um, you can also see that there is this Cascade Glacier that runs along the back of the Barry Arm landslide and kind of butts up um, to the headscarp of that landslide. So we have a glacier below, a glacier above, and also water below. This is just to emphasize um, the size of this landslide. Um, it's two kilometers wide and one and a half kilometers high and estimates of volume are as high as 500 million cubic meters. Um, the yellow line represents 300 meters, which is the largest typical cruise ship that would be entering these waters. Um, I've read that these types of cruise ships can have upwards of a thousand crew members alone on board. So um, that's not to say, you know, the um, travelers on those ships as well. So in addition to the cities, located on the sound, um, we're also thinking about these transient populations when we think about um, these uh, landslide tsunami hazards. For some geologic context, this is a picture taken on top of the Barry Arm landslide looking um, down fjord. And um, really the whole region is composed of this Cretaceous age Chugash flish 
Um, this is a sequence of rhythmically alternating and deformed and metamorphosed sandstone stone turbidites. The beds, beds range anywhere from a few centimeters to, to many to tens of meters thick. Um, as you can see from this picture, it can be quite disintegrated in some places, such as at Barry Arm, and all of this to say it's not the most competent rock. For some historic context, um, this image on the far left is from 1913, looking northeast up the Barry Arm Glacier in Fjord. Um, this, you know, is, this image is pretty fuzzy and um, the lighting isn't great. You may be able to convince yourself that there's a topographic bulge at that red arrow um, that could indicate the formation of the landslide, but it's not clear. Um, however, in 1937, there are more images. So the center one and the one on the right are the same image. So the one on the right um, is just zoomed in and lightened. Um, here we can, you know, very clearly see the beginning of the formation of the landslide and the headscarp um, outlined in red there. So, you know, this landslide has been around for many decades. Um, this is also evidence of the formation of this landslide prior to glacial retreat from the toe. So you can see the glacier is fully um, across the bottom of the landslide. So, of course, this is not to discount the effects of glacier thinning um, and the influence of, of that on the formation of this landslide. But um, this is just to say that we do have evidence of this landslide dating back to 1937. Um, these are two Google Earth images um, to demonstrate um, this period of gla rapid glacial retreat um, on the left in 1996, on the right 2017, and um, specifically between 2005 and 2017, um, there was a rapid period of deglaciation as the glacier moved from the base of the landslide and um, where it resides in this image on the right is more or less where it resides now in 2023. Prior to our study, um, Diet All in 2020 uh, described landslide and glacial movement. Um, on the top uh, panel here, we have displacement, landslide displacement versus time. On the bottom, we have glacier calving front position also versus time. Um, so, when this glacier uh, really started moving um, after 2005, um, shortly after that, we see a, a drastic increase in landslide velocity, moving from about one meter per year to 26 meters per year. And then when the glacier slowed down again, um, we saw a slow, or they saw a slow in um, landslide velocity. So, you know, they found a good correlation of landslide movement with glacial retreat from the toe um, in the last few decades. Um, and then on the right here is um, one of their elevation change maps, um, which is just to show that they found an overall trend of um, surface elevation decrease in the upper half of the landslide and an increase in the bottom half, um, which will come up again um, in later slides. And I guess I'll also just mention that during this um, rapid period of glacial retreat, the landslide moved about 120 meters um, between 2010 and 2017. So um, it's really been been moving in the past, um, in the recent past. Um, then Barnhart et al. in 2021 um, modeled the tsunamogenic potential. Um, they did several failure scenarios. This is just one I'm showing. Um, they can be found in that report. Um, but th so this is a catastrophic failure scenario in which um, all of the landslide fails and enters the water rapidly. This is a scenario in which the landslide is assumed to have a larger volume and is more mobile. So um, immediately the simulation showed that at point A, where the barrier arm landslide is, is that there would be a 200 meter tsunami wave, um, which is obviously life threatening. Um, at point B here in 10 to 15 minutes, there would be five meter wave heights in the Southern um, Barry Arm Fjord. In 20 minutes, the wave um, will reach the town of the city of Whittier um, and there will be a two meter wave um, offshore. And then after two hours, that tsunami wave will have traveled through the Prince William Sound. Um, and I'm showing this just to emphasize that um, the failure of this landslide 
um, has the potential to impact the northwest portion of the Prince William Sound. So our study objectives, um, the first was movement evolution. We wanted to define how movement um, has evolved or not evolved from past to present. So we're, we were interested in finding out not only how fast um, and how that the velocity has changed, but also in what way is this landslide moving and what does it tell us about the landslide hazard? Um, the second objective were to look into factors influencing movement and especially with respect to the position of the Berry Glacier. Um, the third was to assess the utility of a static map in this type of environment. So um, we wanted to evaluate the predictive capability of a map of structures and kinematic elements. Um, you know, we assume that in dynamic environments such as this, the landslides are dynamic as well. We were looking for um, evidence or not evidence of, of this point. And then the final is um, the hazard implications. So um, really just applying what we learn um, with our surveillance data to hazard implications for this landslide. And thinking about other landslides in this region. Because spoiler alert, there are more than one landslide in this region. So the methods we use, we were really trying to get behind um, three main things. The first is cumulative movement since landslide inception. And to do this, um, we created a structural and kinematic map from LIDAR and bathymetry data. The second is current and ongoing movement patterns, so recent movement, um, to be able to compare it to cumulative movement. Um, to look at current movement, we used LIDAR differencing and ground and satellite synthetic aperture radar. And the final is to look at surface activity and to describe any events we see um, to be able to time those events. To do this, we use seismic monitoring. So this top panel here is showing um, the landslide area and the outline of the radar set um, SAR scene. So we were tasking radar set two for this. Um, it's a C-band instrument with a two meter spatial resolution and it's acquired every 24 days. The bottom is zooming in now to the landslide and actually um, speaking of other landslides, this landslide B is just up, just up um, valley. We're not gonna be talking about this today, but um, there's another one right there. Um, this, so this shows uh, the ground instrumentation locations. So everything in yellow, um, these three yellow points are seismic stations. They're composed of three component broadband sampled at 50 Hertz and strong motion sensors sampled at 100 Hertz and telemetered in real time. Um, the orange triangle is the location of the ground-based INSAR. This has a wavelength of 1.7 centimeters, which is the KU frequency. Um, it acquires every 10 minutes, and the spatial resolution um, is less than a meter. And um, LIDAR, LIDAR was flown five times via aircraft, and those DTM digital terrain models um, had a 10 centimeter resolution. So the results outline, um, just because we're going to be touching on a lot first, I'll present the structure and kinematic map um, and then dive into movement so we can constantly reference back to that structure and kinematic map. So for movement, um, we're going to talk about the timeline of events. So when things happened, um, we'll talk about general observations, which will give you a sense of where and how the landslide is moving. And then we'll dive into two, um, two points in more detail, which is evidence of glacier influence and then two examples of kinematic evolution at this landslide. And then finally, I know I can't get away um, without talking about why, although I will say that there is a lot more work um, that should be done to uh, describe the why this landslide is moving. So structure and kinematic elements, um, this is our map. It's very uh, detailed. Um, there's no way I could possibly describe everything, um, but I will point out a few things that we will um, talk about throughout this uh, presentation. So um, 
there are four kinematic elements that were identified, and these are separated by strike slip faults in other observations um, in cumulative movement. So in other words, these represent areas that are moving differently across the slide. So the first is the kite. It's in green here, and it's named the kite because it looks like a kite. Um, so the kite, the upper portion of the kite, which I'm circling right now, is the seemingly unsupported um, bedrock portion. Um, and I'm saying that because in this area here, there's there's no bedrock in this lower half. It's rattling debris, um, hence the lack of, of features that are identified on this map. Um, we don't know the history of this bottom portion, um, but I'm just saying all this to, to emphasize that there is this kind of upper portion that's seemingly unsupported. So then next to the kite is the prow um, shown in blue. The prow is named the prow because it looks like it juts into the water, like the prow of the ship. And um, I'll point out that this black dashed line um, that I'm outlining right now with my cursor is this talus accumulation zone. And you can see that it's really the largest in the prow element, um, which tells us that the prow has experienced um, the most downslope movement um, in, in terms of its cumulative history. Uh, next to the core, or sorry, next to the prow is the core, which is in red. Um, smaller tantalus accumulation zone. It's also um, the, the glacier is still partially beneath this element, which is important um, for later discussions. And then finally, the tail is the furthest to the north, and that one is still um, fully buttressed. I shouldn't say buttressed, but the glacier is fully beneath the toe or the tail. Um, so in general, the Barry Arm landslide has distinct boundaries with a well-developed headscarp, which is this yellow line outlined here on top. Um, the kinematic elements, um, the moving portion, have a relatively fast rate of motion. And um, this is kind of a common geomorphic expressions of other deep seated landslides. Um, in areas where there's been, um, where the downslope extension from sliding is relatively high, we see an abundance of downhill facing scarps, um, such as in um, the top portion of the prow and, and now in the kite. Um, so this is a photo that's taken. Um, at the headscarp and kind of looking obliquely across the kite uh, down uh, valley or down the fjord. And you can see that there's this abundance of um, downhill facing scarps and um, potentially new talus from recent, recent movement. And then in areas where the downslope extension from sliding is relatively low, we see an abundance of uphill facing scarps. Um, this photo was taken um, in this area, looking downslope towards the water, and you can see all these uphill facing scarps um, in this photo here. Um, I want to point out that there's very little toe expression of the landslide. Um, there's a few thrust faults um, shown here in blue, but there's no evidence of a through going thrust fault. And um, there's a couple of reasons that this might be. The first is that these are subtle features. So the bathymetric data, which is four meters, may not have been higher enough resolution compared to the 0.1 meter subaerial LIDAR data to see. Um, there also may have not been enough landslide deformation following glacier retreat to form um, the thrust fault. So the glacier could have been removing debris at a pace that outpaced this landslide deformation. Um, and the final potential is that the dominant response to upslope movement in the lower, lower quarter of the landslide um, could be to just thicken and then ravel debris into the water. Um, so you can see that there's a, a lack of um, distinct features in this portion outside of this area here, which is bedrock. But in this portion, um, there's really a lot of um, raveling of debris into the water and also highlighted is this potential glacial trim line. Okay, so now let's talk about when um, we see uh, events over our study period. Um, 
In the bottom here is when the surveillance data was collected from the various methods that were used. And on the top are the events that we saw, um, both deformation events in pink and then rock fall or rock avalanche events in gray. Um, so generally, it's the landslide is variably but frequently active. Um, we have you know, evidence of localized movement. So for example, just the kite um, was moving in this period. And then we have periods of landslide wide movement. Um, on top of that, we have the surface activity. So I'm only showing three um, kind of more significantly sized rock fall or rock avalanche um, activity, but the surface activity of the landslide is pretty constant. Um, so when um, I talk about the localized movement, I'm talking about, you know, this is on the order of centimeters to tens of centimeters. And then for the landslide wide movement, this could be upwards of six meters. Um, so it's still um, there. It's still variable, but it is still moving um, quite a bit when it does move um, landslide wide. Um, this is a good point to a good time to point out that this is a really challenging environment to work in. The landslide itself is extremely steep. There is very little bedrock exposure. Um, it's hard to land a helicopter anywhere or to install instrumentation. Like I said, there's tons of surface activity. Um, so instrument, instrumentation on the landslide doesn't last very long. In fact, this um, seismic station BAW was taken out um, by rockfall activity. Um, so there is no longer um, any seismic stations on the landslide itself, but there's others that were installed around. Um, similarly, you know, the ground-based INSAR um, was taken out in this winter period because um, we were worried about rock avalanche, or sorry, snow avalanche activity. Um, and really, you know, a multi-method approach allows us to fill in gaps where a given method fails for any number of reasons. Um, so radar sat, while it's acquired, it was required pretty continuously during this time, it's, it's really only useful during the summer months. So there's a lot of pluses and minuses um, to all of these data sets. Um, and I guess I'll also point out, so the LIDAR dates are there. It was collected five times, like I said before. OK, so now moving into general observations, um, we can use uh, LIDAR elevation change maps um, to talk about this. Um, so again, frequently but variably active, Deformation ranges from superficial processes to landslide wide deformation. And um, there is a spatial and temporal variation component as well. Um, in the, so these are showing elevation change again, where red colors are loss of elevation and blue um, are a gain. So in this upper left panel, this is kind of stepping in time from 2020 through 2022, different epochs. Here we can see a very large rock avalanche event um, where the source area is in red and the deposit is in blue. That's just coming right down through the core. This was a 650,000 um, cubic meter rock avalanche. Um, in the top right, we see evidence of landslide wide deformation in a similar pattern that Dye et al. found, which is that elevation decrease in the top portion, um, elevation increase in the bottom. In this epoch in the bottom um, left, there's no landslide wide deformation, but there is evidence of smaller um, events. So this rock avalanche area was still had some activity. There was also another landslide here near the glacier uh, terminus. And then bottom right, we're seeing um, uh, more deformation, um, landslide wide deformation, again, in a similar pattern like Diadol. Um, and overall, the kite um, has been moving faster um, during these landslide wide deformation events. This um, is showing manual feature tracking over the full study period. Um, so this is done using that LIDAR data um, and manually tracking those features. Um, and I think this does a good job of showing the spatial, spatial variation across the landslide. So this is Horizontal displacement on the left, vertical on the right, both have the same plunge. Um, this really emphasizes that that kite 
it has the, been experiencing the largest displacements over our study period. Um, this is also subtle, but I want to point out that the upper half, um, the vertical uh, displacements are higher than horizontal, and this switches in the bottom. So in the bottom, the horizontal displacements are larger. So what does that mean? Um, either uh, the landslide could be truly bulging in the lower half, um, which might be evidence for some sort of toe pinning, or um, it could be telling us something about the basal slip zone geometry, which is that it's shallowing towards the landslide toe. So no, no bulging or pinning, but just that this, the um, zone is shallowing. And, and then this would cause the horizontal displacements to exceed the vertical displacements. Um, uh, while this may be the case, it may narrow down geometry, but not fully, which is shown well by um, Gluer et al. in 2019. Um, so they show that this could be achieved either, this shallowing towards the toe can be achieved either with a curvilinear surface um, or a bilinear basal surface. So there's still more to unravel here about the depth of slip surface and the geometry, and also how it varies across this very large landslide complex. Okay, so let's now get into um, evidence of glacier influence on how the landslide is moving. And so now we can bring in SAR and compare it to LIDAR. So on the left, we've seen this LIDAR image before with that rock avalanche event. On the right is that satellite radar set, um, satellite SAR image. This is an interferogram um, that is a map of deformation. Um, again, radar set is two meters resolution, every acquired every 24 days. These are more or less the same time period, these two. Um, these two data sets are covering more or less the same time period. So in the SAR image, the cycles of color represent 2.8 centimeters of displacement. Um, these cycles of color are called fringes. Um, and so anywhere you can see fringes, that's where we can measure deformation. In the pixelated areas, those are areas of incoherence and where it's not possible to compare the radar wave from the first acquisition with the second. There are many reasons why this occurs, um, but in the case of Barry Arm, it's typically because either the landslide is moving faster than the maximum detectable deformation rate, which for us is 2.8 centimeters from one pixel to the next, or um, there's been too much surface movement, so the surface has changed too much. Um, so now I'm drawing this dashed line um, about where the glacial terminus sits. And um, I'm doing this to point out that the fringe patterns do a good job of showing that the landslide area above the glacier is moving quite differently than the landslide area um, above the water. Um, so the fringe pattern above the glacier is look, looks a little more chaotic. Um, it's their fringes are spaced irregularly, they're oriented irregularly. And it, it tells us that the glacier may be limiting movement in this region. Versus um, above water, we see this kind of, um, and especially in this region here, um, we see this pattern of kind of evenly spaced um, fringes that show that this whole area has kind of moved down slope together. So um, I, this again shows that we're experiencing a difference in movement and perhaps the location of this rock avalanche is, is not a coincidence. Um, it could represent kind of a new point of weakness between two regions that are, are moving quite differently. And um, again, because of the location of that glacier terminus. We can also see evidence of this um, not only in the SAR, um, but also in our structure map. So uh, if we take cross sections above and not above the glacier. Um, in pre-glacier retreat, areas of predominantly compression thickening or lower extension um, are predominant, sorry. <laughs> and then in Post-glacier retreat, um, it switches in areas of predominantly high extension um, 
are more common. So, and also in, in this pre-glacial retreat, we see kind of a variety of uphill and downhill facing scars. And then post-glacial retreat, we see a more abundant um, downhill facing scars. Um, so I guess this, the question is then, you know, can we expect the core once that glacier has fully retreated to behave more similarly to the prowl? Um, I think that's something that we will be, um, it will be interesting to see um, if and when this glacier retreats. Um, so now we're going to get into two examples of kinematic evolution. The first is um, related to the kite. So <clears throat> here are two schematics. The left represents kind of landslide inception through to 2017. Um, and then the right one represents our period of observation. Um, so on the left, we can think of that as kind of the historical cumula cumulative um, movement. So in a cumulative sense, um, the prow has moved further downslope than the upper portion of the kite. Um, so there's this right lateral sense of motion on the strike slip fault. And again, that large area of talus accumulation. Um, however, in our period of surveillance, we've seen that the kite has been moving faster than the prow. And so the sense of motion has been reversed. We've, this is a kinematic reversal. Um, and this is quite interesting because these strike slip faults are zones of weakness. And this is telling us that they can change as a function of how kinematic elements respond to glacier retreat or just time and evolution of the landslide and potential other environmental conditions. This is also interesting when we think about um, the tsunami hazard. So this um, I'm showing here on the left satellite INSAR on the right ground-based INSAR um, to show two different instances of evidence of the kite moving independently. Um, again, um, the kite is this, this upper half is kind of this seemingly unsupported um, area with no exposed stable bedrock down slope. And um, we can see that the kite is influencing this boundary into the prow a bit, but, but pretty much the, the deformation is constrained to the kite. And so now that the kite has, we've seen this kinematic reversal and the kite is moving um, more rapidly and independently of other um, kinematic elements, this has very different implications for the volume of material entering the water um, and with implications for the tsunami generating potential. However, um, it's not quite as simple as that because we also have evidence of the kite potentially influencing other kinematic elements. Um, and it could be, you know, like kind of a chicken and the egg scenario where either the kite moving could influence movement of other elements or potentially whatever is initiating movement of the kite could then be initiating the other elements in turn. Um, so this is all um, radar set, or sorry, this is all satellite INSAR scenes again. Um, the top is from fall of 2020 and the bottom is from fall of 2022 and um, I'm showing both of these years because it kind of happened the same way um, both of these years so what was happening is in this first column we see this kind of creeping motion of the kite in this upper portion that we see fairly often um, then the kite begins to move and again, the kite is quite incoherent, but we know from our LIDAR data that and ground-based SAR data that the kite was moving. Um, and you can see it then beginning to influence the prow. And then in the next set of data, next set of scenes, um, this movement has expanded to include all of the elements. Again, there's a lot of incoherent areas, but from our other methods, we're able to piece it all together. Um, so. The kite can move independently. It can also, we can also see this kind of kinematic jostle of all these elements. Um, and it seems to kind of vary um, uh, whether or not this is going to happen or whether the kite is, is just going to continue to move um, independently. So 
the kite and the reversal um, is evidence of kinematic evolution. Um, the second evidence for kinematic evolution is that we are seeing movement across strike slip boundaries. Um, and so this tells us, you know, if things are moving on either side of a kinemet or of a strike slip boundary in tandem, as opposed to differentially, um, this is telling us that that strike slip boundary, um, potentially it's not being utilized anymore. So these are two examples again from radar. This is kind of a triangular area of deformation above the Bay Glacier. We can see this deformation happening continuously over the boundary between the core and tail. Over on the right, again, just the central portion of the landslide, we can see all of that kind of move down slope together. Um, so these are two instances in which, um, you know, these boundaries that were inferred from optical and LIDAR based mapping um, no longer appear to be utilized in these instances of deformation. And so these kinematic elements and their boundaries appear to be evolving. Okay, so um, why uh, is a great question um, and something that um, is still being unraveled. But one point I want to make is that um, the glacier front really hasn't moved that much over our period of surveillance in the last couple of years. Um, nonetheless, there has been landslide wide movement upwards of you know four to six meters. Um, so, it's not moving to the degree that it has moved in the past um, associated with that big period of glacial retreat. But nonetheless, it is still moving. It is still moving several meters per year sometimes. Um, and so I think that's evidence that we're seeing a shift in what's influencing this landslide to move potentially. And um, it's more than just glacial retreat that is now causing this landslide to move. Um, I will say, so again, this is that triangular area above, directly above the Barry Glacier. Um, when we were in the field, we did notice these arcuate crevice, crevasses that may be indicative of calving and future calving. So again, like the thinning and calving of the glacier is, is looks like to looks to be influencing um, localized movement at least um, on the landslide. Um, another question we have to ask ourselves is um, is about climate, and this is a very rainy place. It's a very snowy place, and um, the events that we see, um, both landslide-wide movement and rockfall, rock avalanche events, tend to be occurring in the fall, late fall. Um, so we can use some seismic data to unravel this a little bit. Um, or start to. Um, so this is a 40 day spectrogram showing seismic noise from two stations. Um, this one on top is BAW, which was located here on the Barry Arm Glacier or Barry Arm landslide, and bottom is BAE, which was located across the fjord. And so these spectrograms represent the signal strength of loudness of signal um, at different frequencies over time. Um, so we have the seismic frequency on the left and time on the bottom. And then down here we have cumulative rainfall from regional stations, um, same time on the bottom and millimeters of cumulative rain um, on the y-axis. So when we're looking at the spectrogram, these low frequency energies here um, represent storm and wave actions in the Gulf of Alaska on the micro seism. Um, Elevated energies between one and four hertz about is associated with glacier calving events, and then strong energy above 10 hertz uh, is associated with rock falls and mudslides occurring closer to the seismic stations. So in both of these um, recordings, the glacier noise and um, the micro seism is about the same. You know, obviously the, the noise at BAW from the glacier is higher um, because it's closer to the glacier. Um, but then on this BAW, we see evidence of energy directly from the slide, which was related to rock falls and rock slides. And coincidentally, um, there was also landslide wide deformation at this time. Um, unclear if they're related. But if we look at, you know, when noise began in the seismogram, um, 
and how the cumulative rain um, occurred. We see the storm beginning um, and then shortly, you know, after uh, the storm has begun, but nearly 300 um, millimeters of cumulative rain have um, occurred, we start seeing this increase of activity at Barium. So for now, this is, um, I'll call this a coincidence, um, but it is something to consider. Um, like I said, we have three going on four years of data. So um, this is something to just um, think about, we're thinking about. Um, and I will just say that these um, really intense rainfall periods are not uncommon for this area. So a final plug before we conclude is was really like the multi-method approach was really critical for unraveling um, what was going on at this landslide. And again, bringing back these two images, you've already seen you know, looking at if we just had SAR and we were just looking at SAR, um, we would have absolutely no information about this kite element. It would be totally um, incoherent. But comparing it to LIDAR, we now can say, um, you know, why it's incoherent. It's because it's moving too fast. It's because there's too much material raveling. And, and same with um, this part, which is the rock avalanche completely took out the signal. It would be pretty, it's Pretty mysterious when I was first looking at this um, SAR data, you know, why this was, but now we have um, clear evidence. So it really, using all of these methods together um, really helps us interpret each other. And I don't, we would not have as continuous of an understanding of this landslide without them all. You know, and again, um, like LIDAR covers large time frames because they're surveys. Um, so the SAR can narrow down those time frames, but we can't use SAR in the winter months, um, whereas LIDAR, we have this cumulative sense of displacement over those winter months. So um, again, just filling in all the gaps has been, it's been really useful to have all of these um, different mapping and monitoring methods. So final thoughts, um, returning to our objectives. So movement evolution, I think we've done a good job of showing that short-term deformation patterns can deviate from relic structures and that our multi-sensor characterization was really required to capture landslide events. So there's really no silver bullet to measure the various sizes, complexities, and styles of movement at this landslide. Um, factors influencing movement. Um, I think we have evidence to say that the glacier is influencing a kinematic element boundary shift. Um, and that the yearly patterns of movement that we've seen very recently um, are not correlated to glacial retreat. So um, there's still more to do about unraveling the influence of rain, glacier melt, and snow melt. Um, and static map assessment, I think we can say that the geomorphological past is not necessarily the key to the future in these environments. Um, they are, in fact, creating dynamic landslides, dynamic environments, and create dynamic landslides. Um, you know, if we were just to use a static map, um, these presumed relationships might be wrong um, in considering our hazards. So we, in this case, um, do need multi-temporal data to do the best we can to understand the hazard. Um, so, you know, the hazard implications, um, this catastrophic failure of portion of all the landslide does have big implications for the volume of material entering the water and the resulting tsunami simulations. And I think we we may expect to see further evolution as the glacier continues to retreat. Um, so again, those regular assessments will be key. Um, so I'm leaving up here on the left two websites. Um, the first is hosted by DDGS, and um, this is a status page and updates of the landslide. You can go there to see um, what's going on with the landslide, how it's moving. Um, what instrumentation is being installed or fixed or kind of what's going on in the field um, and in this project. And then the bottom one is a story map, um, which is just really a nice display of, of all the instrumentation that's been installed and um, what it's telling us. So thank you so much. <laughs>